The earliest memory I had uh, of a Fender Rose, actually seeing one, uh, was at my house. <laughs> my father uh, used to play chess with this gentleman, um, and I can't remember his name, but uh, he used to come over pretty often. And uh, one time he brought a, a Fender Rose over, I think, for us to keep it, you know, to store it. And um, that was my first time seeing this thing. And it didn't have the cable, he didn't have some of the parts, so I could only hear it just acoustically without, you know, being plugged up. So it must have been a year that thing sat in our house. And I'd just play it, you know. Um, finally, uh, my pops went and got this connector, and uh, the thing came to life. It was amazing. It was, uh, it wasn't like a piano, put it like that. And that's, that's the thing that I, pretty much, that's the instrument that I'd, I'd known well at that point, that and the Moog, so. Being introduced to this baby was uh, a life changer. I don't really consider this, as much as it's using electricity to project itself, it's an acoustic instrument that's, that's then electrified with pickups, you know, but it makes all the sound without any electrical, you know, uh, interaction. So um, to me, it's, it's, it's an acoustic instrument still. <laughs> You know, it's just like putting a microphone on a piano, you know, that's electric. I mean, thankfully that, that this, this piece existed, I mean, it would be impossible for a piano player to really carry a piano around. And a lot of the venues in D.C., uh, I grew up in Washington, D.C., and a lot of these venues uh, didn't have pianos at that time. Um, a lot of the ones that I was able to get into at the time. So this was the instrument of choice. I look at them as blind dates, you know. Um, you know, you have to get to know them. You can't just approach them like, you know, like you know them. Even though they look the same, they look very familiar. But each one of them is different. They each has a personality. And, you know, oftentimes as a piano player, because we, we travel, we can't carry a piece like this with us. We have to depend on backline. So that, that's what I call my blind date. You know, just the, the moment that, you know, that you await to meet her and then find out what's happening, you know. Sometimes you might be missing a few keys, be out of tune, you know. And then you gotta work around those things just to get the beauty out of it, so. Yeah, this is a beautiful blind date. It's a pleasure to meet her. <laughs> I don't think other people, other countries really had as many of them as we had here, obviously. So they're hard to come by, you know. Um, most, most musicians use what they can get abroad, you know. Um, in Africa, the Casio is kind of like God over there, you know. And I think it's just because of the, the resources. You know, I, I know they go crazy for roads over there. But um, when I was in, in Africa, they, they, they had a grand piano. They had, uh, they had pretty much everything. I, they didn't have a Fender Rose for me, though. So, you know, I played, a, I think I played a motif over there. Uh, in Brazil, there's, there's I can find a Fender Rose very easy down there. So every time I've gone there, in fact, I did a, a live album uh, for the Free Jazz Festival in 1998, and uh, that was my piece. I, I, I requested a rose, and they had the 73 uh, suitcase for me. You know, it was a beautiful sound, and it's recorded as well. Um, uh, places, like, places like Japan, um, Europe, you could find it you know, pretty easily. In 1999, I, uh, I put out this record called uh, Roads Ahead Volume One. Um, I had already put out four records as a leader. I wanted to put the roads in a drum and bass atmosphere, you know. Um, also, with the elements of jazz improvisation, um, uh, but coming from the roads. And um, it was a step away from what people wished I would do at the time. But it was accepted like with open arms. Where, you know, a lot of people were like, ooh, I don't think you should do that, man. You should go back to doing the piano thing. I'm, you know, I knew what I wanted to do. I'm producing my records. I'm the producer, so I know what this is gonna be. I know why I'm doing it. And I put it out, and I won the Best New Artist of the Year for, with uh, uh, BET and Billboard. They celebrated that record. 
and uh, Herbie introduced me, <laughs> which I thought was like, that was a mind blower, you know, to celebrate this piece and then be in the company of, of one of my, in, you know, most inspirational uh, musicians that ever touched me, you know. In preparation for this new album, which is called Roads Ahead, Volume 2, uh, it's a dedication to, to this, you know, um, and it was been 16 years in between Volume 1 and Volume 2, so I, I, I changed up instruments, I'd gotten rid of the roads that I had. I think maybe I had two or three since then, but I called Wallace Roney uh, to find out if he knew, you know, of any roads possible uh, on the market. First thing he was like, yeah, when do you want it? I have one. I was like, oh, wow, it kind of came a little sudden. I wanted to shop around a little bit. And then he told me, he's like, you know my roads is in mint condition, right? I was like, okay, I'm coming to get it. So uh, I, uh, Wallace Roney sold me his 73. Um, and I mean, that's just, that's, that's my partner now. I, just, I don't go anywhere without that roads. Yeah. So I've had it about, I guess, a year now and I recorded the, the new album with that piece. So I want to play a Moroccan piece. This is called Essawera Walks. <laughs> 